Well, I want to thank all of you all for being here this evening. Quite an honor for me to be up here. Um, as some of you know, I am almost 86 years of age. Today I'm not as sharp mentally as I was 30 years ago. As I stand here before you, I am speaking way outside my comfort zone. I believe that most of you might be better Christians than I am. I have been a sinner in my lifetime, and I am an imperfect man. Over 30 years ago, I began writing down the many miracles in my life. Presently, I have almost three pages of my miracles. Over a year ago, I began thinking that it would be a shame for me to leave this earth without me telling my family and my close friends about my miracles. About two months ago, I wondered if I should present maybe the most dramatic miracles in a church setting. And here we are this evening. Over the past month or more, I have been awakened during the night and I would be thinking about several of these miracles. I truly believe that my Heavenly Father has been speaking to me to encourage me about presenting some of my miracles. By me doing this, it might be beneficial to lots of people. And now I want to convey several more thoughts. My presentation is not to tell you what a great man that I am, nor that I have done some great things in my life. That's not the purpose of why I'm here. During my presentation, I'm merely a messenger. I'm a messenger about my Heavenly Father and my Lord and Savior, Jesus. I'm the recipient of all of these miracles. This is about my Heavenly Father and my Lord Jesus. They are 100% responsible for all these miracles. Please remember this. There's one more thing I would like to share with you. After I was born and through my childhood, my brain evidently was not fully developed. I began to notice this as a teenager where I had an issue with remembering and memorizing. I believe that I am somewhat below normal, but I am a very blessed man. Now I have a couple of pages of miracles from the Bible that we want to show you. It's probably a little hard for you all to be able to see these, but the, these are two, there are two pages of these miracles that we have in our Bible. Just, just astounding. I don't know whether how many of you all would know where these are in your Bible, or if you can find them where you have a, where they're summarized, but the church here, I'm sure, would be glad to provide copies if uh, you might not have them. Next is a copy of the miracles of Jesus in chronological order. These are astounding. Just, uh, just, just magnificent miracles. Now I want to begin telling you about the 11 miracles in my life. Before I do this, I want to read a verse for you. It's Job chapter 5, verse 9. He performs wonders that cannot be fathomed, miracles that cannot be counted. First miracle we have, my very first one, is Jimmy Gilbert. This was a grapevine accident that happened in 1947. This all happened in, again in 1947, two years after World War II ended. There were five of us boys who were 10 years old. We'd been playing in the woods about a half a mile from where I lived. We were just below a ridge which was above a big valley. The mountainside below the ridge was very steep. There were lots of fairly good sized trees 
and many of them were really tall. Several of these trees had good-sized grapevines. I don't know whether any of you all, maybe when you were children, swing on grapevines, but this is what we were doing. We learned how to cut the grapevines just above the ground. We learned how to swing on them. Again, the, 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 the steepness of the terrain was just about like this. Here's a tree up here, and we would swing, cut the grapevine at the bottom, go back up the hill, and run down the hill, and way out in the air, and come back over and over again. We've been doing this for way over a month. One day we were all swinging on the grapevine. Three of the boys said that they were tired and they'd like to go home. Jimmy Gilbert, a good friend, said he wanted to swing just one more time. I told Jimmy that I would wait until he completed his swing. Jimmy ran down the hill, going out in the, out in, like in space, and all of a sudden something happened. And Jimmy was no longer on the grapevine. He was going through the air. All that I was able to see when he hit that big tree, um, he, he hit that big tree right in his midsection. That was all I could see. There was trees, limbs all around, and um, just the impact right there was all I could see of Jimmy. He disappeared. I would guess it had to have been probably maybe 30 feet above the ground. I went to see a family in the neighborhood, the closest house by the name of Paris Compton and his wife. They had to call for a taxi cab. They didn't have this after the war. They didn't have a car. The taxi cab came and uh, we loaded Jimmy up into the taxi cab, took him to the hospital. A surgeon by the name of Dr. Vermilia operated on Jimmy. He, his, his intestines, when that lick on that tree, ruptured his intestines. I was told by a member of the hospital staff that had Jimmy arrived one hour later, he would have been dead. That's how close he came. This tragic event shows that miracles can happen to children. Our Heavenly Father and Jesus were with all of us and all the other people who helped Jimmy to live. Jimmy was released from the hospital after being there for three or four days. Jimmy would have been killed if his neck or his head had hit that big tree. You can imagine a little 10 year old boy is not that far from, from a 10 year old from, from here up to the neck and the head. Just a few inches away. Jesus and our Heavenly Father had their arms around Jimmy to save his life. It would require another 20 minutes to give a more detailed report of this accident and this miracle. Miracle number two. This was about my graduation from Virginia Tech in 1961. When I went to Virginia Tech to be tested, the people at Virginia Tech told me that I was at best very marginal to where I could be accepted to be a student at Virginia Tech. Then from the, when I went to the orientation at Virginia Tech, we were told when we were there that um, if you graduate four years from now, most likely the person to your left and the person on your right were not going to be there, and that's what happened to me. It took me three years at Virginia Tech to finish the first two. I just missed being on academic probation several times during those first three years. That was a continuous nightmare for me. I learned that I had a very severe memory issues then and I still have that problem today. I have problems remembering some people's names. I have, sometimes I'm unable to remember Bible verses. I greatly admire Pastor Yule and all the people in this church building, those of you who teach uh, like Wednesday night, teach Sunday school, Bible school, uh, you are just great. You do something that I just not, would not be able to do. Most of the time when I was at Virginia Tech, I was scared. <laughs> I'm, just, 
I'm like a scared rabbit. I was afraid that I might not make it. Then a very big miracle that I had made it, and about 67% of the students did not graduate. I was able to graduate. My car was not moved for several weeks at a time from the Virginia Tech parking lot. My dad and my football coach helped to give me the will to win. That determination to keep going through the bad and tough times has helped me all through my life. My Heavenly Father and Jesus guided me through this fierce storm. I am so blessed. My next miracle is number three. is about surveying towers in the United States Army. This happened in 1962, 1963. I was drafted into the United States Army. I served on active duty for two years from October 1961 to October 1963. I was based out of Fort Belvoir, Northern Virginia in a surveying company. Half of my company went overseas and I remained here. We did two very large surveying projects. The first one was in Front Royal in Winchester, Virginia area. And the second big area was in northern Florida and southern Georgia in the Okefenokee Swamp. There were four of us who were people like me that were college graduates, uh, just gotten out of school and we were in the military. We volunteered to learn how to build steel surveying towers from 70 feet to 120 feet above the ground, if you can imagine being up in the air like that. We had a leader, so to speak, his name was Pat Thomas, and Pat's job in civilian life was to build and take down these towers. Pat was like a monkey uh, on these towers, walking around up there, and we were scared to death to be there. <laughs> we were not skilled at doing this. None of us had ever been probably more than 15 feet about above the ground on a ladder. All of us had safety belts on when we began. We had to use steel bolts and nuts to connect each piece of steel to the next piece of steel. Each piece of steel was numbered. Uh, this was like doing a very large puzzle. As we continued to go up with building the towers, our knuckles on our hands became white. Some of you all probably heard of having white knuckles. Well, I guarantee you the four of us, we all had white knuckles, being scared, being above 15 feet above the ground. Sometimes I was part of a team that would do the surveying in the daytime and at night. You can learn about all these towers by looking up Bilby, spelled B-I-L-B-Y, towers. Climbing one of these towers uh, in complete darkness is very scarce, scary when you first do it. We did not do these towers every day. We had many other surveying tasks on the ground that we had to do. This was a miracle for the four of us. None of us were severely injured and all of us lived. Our Heavenly Father and Jesus were always with us. I could speak for another hour about these miracles. Now my next miracle is near death, potential death near Rosedale on Route 19 this happened in 1970. I'm traveling from Rosedale in Russell County, you know, from Lebanon going to Claypool Hill is Rosedale. I'm going to a uh, meeting that I was responsible for, and I'm traveling by myself in my car. You're all probably familiar with the, when you leave Rosedale going through Clay, Clay, Claypool Hill, there's a long straight stretch. Um, at that time, there was four lanes going toward uh, what was sort of a crest of a, a little bit of a hill. The road went up, and you have the crest, and then it goes down. Well, before you get to the crest, it became a two-lane road. Well, I'm driving by myself, doing about 55 miles an hour, 
in a light rain. As I top up over this crest, here in my lane, here's a car in my lane. I'm, I'm looking right at this car. To my left is a tractor trailer going the other way, going toward Rosedale. You can imagine, here I am, and just, if this happened just like a flash, just bang, it was that quick. I swerved my car. Somehow, I was able to miss both vehicles, the car that was in my lane, the tractor trailer. What happened was the driver in that tractor trailer, he could see what was going to happen, I guess, because he was way above the road. He had his tractor trailer rig all the way over on the shoulder. I, I, my guess is that he had been straddling the edge of the road. Uh, an incredible miracle that I lived through that, just that quick. My guess is that truck on the left, I couldn't have missed that much, that truck, and to my right, the car, that much. The car was trying to go from the lane coming toward me across my lane to get to a little market over on my right. That's what almost caused this accident. My Heavenly Father and Jesus had had to have been with me through that episode. I am convinced that my Heavenly Father and Jesus, they had to have been steering my vehicle, my steering wheel, and the steering wheel in that tractor trailer. If I hit either one of those vehicles, that truck or the car driving at the speed I'm going, I'm, I'm done, I'm dead. Well, I'm, I'm traveling to Richlands to a big bid opening. I had a client, um, s, s Corporation, hired me to do a design uh, to move their manufacturing plant from Richlands, Virginia, up to Claypool Hill. Bernard Simmons was the CEO. Um, he was the founder, one of the founders of s, s Corporation. And the number two guy in the firm was Ralph Davis. He was like the CFO. And they hired me to do the design to, to remove a mountain, a large mountain in Claypool Hill where their new manufacturing plant could be built. I had designed a lot of roads all around the, this plant area. And um, I'm completely responsible for everything that's done, including the water and the sanitary sewer. The purpose of me traveling to Richlands, um, Bernard and Ralph, we're there in Richlands, and we we're going to have a bid opening to use my plans to see if we could get a contractor who could give us a decent price to remove this mountain. So about 20 minutes after this almost fatal accident happened at Rosedale, I arrive at Richlands. I get out of my car. I'm standing. I open my door, and I had all my materials over uh, where my seat is, and I stand up. I'm telling you, my legs were shaking. I was shaking so bad I could hardly stand up. I, I was, as you can imagine, I'm still scared. How in the world I was able to drive 20 minutes in my car was hard to imagine. But I'm standing there, and it seemed like it took a turn, even though it was a minute or more, to where I could get my legs to stop shaking, to where I could walk into the building. I walk into the building. And uh, Bernard Simmons, Ralph Davis, my friends, were there to greet me, and they look at me and they say, Sandy, what in the world is wrong with you? You are white as a sheet. And I had to tell them what happened. Well, we got through the bid opening, had a successful bid opening, got us a contractor, and the site was, was constructed. My Heavenly Father and Jesus saved my life from being killed in that possible collision with that truck and the car. That, this was a major miracle that saved my life. There's no other, no other explanation. My next miracle, number five, is, becoming, is being a professional engineer license. This happened in 1981. My engineering 
career began in 1961. 20 years later, I decided to try again to become a professional licensed engineer. I just told you about my difficulties with school. I know of several fellow engineers who have not been able to pass this very tough engineering exam. I drive to Richmond, Virginia with a suitcase full of engineering books and everything that I'm allowed to use. I have many of those books I hadn't used in 10 years. One of the main reasons that I passed this exam was due to the large variety of engineering projects that I was able to do over the past 20 years. The other reason that I passed this examination was my Heavenly Father and Jesus were with me. Knowing my mental condition and, and, and me being able to do things that are challenging mentally, it had to be that they were with me. So many other fellow engineers who I was convinced were much smarter than me, they were not able to pass that examination. I became a licensed professional engineer in the states of Virginia, Tennessee, and North Carolina, thanks to Jesus and my Heavenly Father. My next, thank you. My next miracle is my clay project in King William County. This happened in 1991, 1995. I joined my first cousin on this very long journey he owned about 1,100 acres on a family farm that had a large area where a high-grade clay was discovered that could be used to make cat litter. I did all the engineering plans and reports that would be used to secure all the local and state and federal permits. I was responsible for most all of that. This included a tremendous amount of research that I did in a large number of college libraries on our clay and our vast cat litter market. I recall that there's times where I spent over 100 hours a week of my time to complete the project. A lot of hours in one week, several times. We had to overcome two major legal challenges that were very costly. We had very large meeting at one time where we were required to attend in Norfolk, Virginia. There were two companies just like us who were being examined by every local state and federal, nation, uh, federal agency in the United States. Our meeting room was at least five times the size of this room right here. I've never been in a meeting room that big. Several of those agencies came to our project area, which was in a very rural area. We had enormous challenges that we had to overcome. I was able to have around 400 acres of that property permitted to do the cat litter project. My cousin and I had to borrow lots of money for over four years. We met with several cat litter companies, but we were never able to reach a deal with them to do the project. Um, my cousin and I also met with a number of very wealthy people. They were interested in what we were doing, but um, when we meet with them, we, did, we didn't have any luck in doing a deal with them. Finally, I was able to meet with a great local family who agreed to take a serious look at our project. I met with them several times in their office. Uh, gradually, we went to the project site to meet with my cousin over a period of months. Um, we were able to do a deal with them. We moved forward with the, being a partner in the large cat litter project. And um, we, <clears throat> in 1995, our cat litter partner open their cat litter plan. I could probably spend more than two hours speaking about this complex project. There were so many obstacles and challenges all along the way. I believe there were dozens of miracles within this project and several of them were major miracles. I sincerely believe that my Heavenly Father and Jesus were always with me all along the way in everything that I did, and they made all those miracles happen to overcome all the very complex issues that we had all that time during the design and construction of that project. Next miracle, number seven, I married Audrey Miller in 2009. <laughs> 
My first wife died over a serious bout with cancer. Around 2007, I asked a friend if she might know of a nice lady that I could possibly meet. She introduced me to Audrey Miller. Her husband, Audrey's husband, had died years before my wife had died. Audrey had a great family that I liked, and they liked me. My family liked Audrey, and she liked them. Audrey and I were married in 2009, and Pastor Jewell did our beautiful service. Audrey and I spoke several times. We just knew somehow our Heavenly Father put us together. We are convinced that happened. I consider Audrey's children and grandchildren to be a part of my family, and I love them. Audrey considers my children and my grandchildren to be a part of her family, and I know that she loves them with all of this. I know that we have a bunch of miracles. Our Heavenly Father and Jesus have made this, these, all these miracles happen in this family. I am so blessed to be a part of this family. Next, um, number eight, is a near death in Dr. Sullivan's office. This happened in 2012. This began when I had a serious health issue with my urinary system. I had to have a catheter installed due to some bleeding. I was re referred to a urologist who was not always available and a proper diagnosis and treatment was not done. I did not know this until later. One morning I left to go to a meeting, then I went home. And I, after I got home, I had some very unusual symptoms. And Audrey suggested that I should try to see my doctor, who was Dr. Clint Sullivan. Audrey made the appointment, and I was checked into his office in the waiting area. I then told Audrey that I believe I needed to lay down in my car until I could be seen by the nurse. I just could tell I felt awful. A lady at the reception area heard this conversation. She said, I want you to come with me right now into one of our examining rooms. I was able to lay down on a medical type bed and they began checking my blood pressures and all the vitals. All of a sudden, I began shaking violently, my whole body. I'm laying there and I'm shaking and I pass out. What happened was my, my uh, temperature went way up. That's what caused the shaking and caused me to pass out. It was the temperature, uh, Audrey said, was above 105 degrees. I wake up and Dr. Sullivan is right there with me in a room full of people. Very scary, all these were medical people. Dr. Sullivan suggested that he should have an ambulance to take me to the emergency room at the hospital and have lots of tests done on me. He stated that he believed that I had E. coli. Dr. Sullivan and his staff worked to get my temperature down. Several miracles had already happened when this happened. If this episode had happened at home, or it had happened if I'd been in my car by myself, I probably would have died right there. Dr. Sullivan is my great friend, and he is a great Christian, and for me to be in a doctor's office who is a great Christian, I just, I felt like this had to be, was meant to be, for me to be there and to survive there. I believe that Dr. Sullivan and my Heavenly Father and Jesus were with me and they saved my life right then. When I was in the emergency room, Audrey said that when Dr. Sullivan was with me after I'd passed out, he had a prayer for me and he was visibly shaken. He, he, he could see something that was awful going on. I was in the emergency room all that afternoon and up until around nine o'clock the hospital was full, and they had to open up new rooms on the top floor. The hospital had to, be, had to find nurses for those new rooms. Pastor Yule had to bring a meal to Audrey that she hadn't had anything to eat in a good while. Yule was there with us, and I had another one of these violently shaken episodes. I'm in the bed. We're in that hospital room on the top floor. 
No nurses, no doctors around. Ewell was it. He knew where the ice was. Immediately went to the ice room, got ice, began to ice me down. And um, of course, I'm, I'm still passed out. I have a temperature of over 105 degrees, which is extremely dangerous. Um, I asked Audrey to provide her report about what she remembers about what happened, and here's her report. God had you all to show up in your room. There was not a nurse near where we were. As you all worked with icing you down, he was constantly praying for you. This episode with your condition was much worse than when you were in Dr. Sullivan's office. When I looked at your catheter bag, there was just pure red blood that was flowing into that bag. Both of us were very scared. When the male nurse finally arrived, he took your temperature under your arm. It was 105.3 degrees. Now this is after I'd been iced down by Yule. Um, the nurse, the male nurse came in and he was yelling for help uh, for a doctor to tell him what to do to help his patient. Then I wake up. Another miracle through Yule, my Heavenly Father and Jesus. The doctors were able to determine how to treat me to solve the medical issue. In a few days, I was discharged from the hospital. The next miracle is miracle number nine. This was a potential death in my home. It happened in 2017. One night, I woke up in bed. I jump out of, the floor, out of the bed on the floor. I'm standing there next to the bed. It's dark, and I cannot breathe. I can't get any air to come in, and no air can go out. You can imagine, I am absolutely terrified. I'm standing there, I wanted to show you kind of what happened to me when I'm, I'm standing there by myself in the dark and I can't breathe. This is what I had to do. Thank you. You can imagine. I'm finally starting to breathe. All of this is exactly what happened to me. I don't know how long, but I just kept doing this. And finally, I began to breathe. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for helping me to be able to breathe. I am absolutely terrified, scared to death about what's just happened. All of what you've seen happen here was a miracle from my Heavenly Father and Jesus. Folks, I didn't know what to do then. I wouldn't know how to, you know, if, I wouldn't know how to do it now, except that it happened to me once before. Um, I am convinced that my Heavenly Father and Jesus they had to have been in control of what was happening. I didn't know what to do. I've never seen anything in writing ever that ever describes what happened in an event like that. I would imagine probably that there's been a few people around the globe that have had the same problem as I've had. Most likely, the reason we haven't heard about it, probably none of those people survived, but somehow I did. I'm convinced that Heavenly Father and Jesus, they were controlling my fist when I was doing this. My arms and my brain, for all this stuff happened. Uh, I go downstairs and I sit in my favorite recliner. That is where I slept for more than a month. Over the next two weeks, I had two medical appointments. 
One was a follow-up appointment with my great friend, Dr. Clint Sutherland, and I tell him what had happened to me, and I know that he did a considerable amount of research on this issue, trying to figure out what, what caused this to happen. He sent me to Dr. Robinette, who was a lung specialist in Abingdon. Dr. Robinette ran several tests on me, including an extensive breathing test. Can you hear me? Okay. Dr. Robinette ran several breathing tests on me, and he said, for your age, you're, you've done okay. Um, he, he, after he finished examining me, he said, um, he's going to sch schedule a lot of other tests to be done in the hospital. Uh, strangely enough, a few days later, I have a follow-up appointment with my cardio doctor, Dr. Marez. Uh, Audrey had to get me c connected with Dr. Marez years before to solve a atrial fibrillation problem. Took her about four hours and Dr. Marez solved that problem. She was now my cardio doctor. And I would go to see Dr. Marez about uh, twice a year. Each time before I would go to see her, she would um, have lab work done. I'd meet with her and she would review all the lab work and all that type of thing about what I needed to do to have better health. Well, Dr. Marez had a big file about that thick. And um, I go in, I'm going in her office and she comes in and sits down beside me and, and we start talking and Dr. Marez said, Mr. Robinson, something seems not normal with you. It seemed like there's something was bothering you. Would you tell me what's bothering you? So I began to tell Dr. Marez what had happened to me with that crisis that I had. Dr. Marez gave me a thorough checkup. She wanted to know all about the tests that Dr. Robinette had scheduled that would be done in about two weeks. She said that was not soon enough, and if, I, if she could schedule a test uh, in, in a day or two, would I go? And I said, yes, I would. Two days later, I show up in the hospital about four o'clock in the afternoon um, and started with the first test. The hospital closed, and the rest of the tests, as I recall, had to be done like through the emergency room. There's a bunch of tests that Dr. Marez had ordered. Well, it's about 9.30 after I finished uh, all those tests when I, when I get home. And... Um, this, when I get to the house, and around 10 o'clock that night, Dr. Marez calls me at home. She says, um, in looking at all the, the tests that she had seen, that she had seen, one lung was a little cloudy, but she was positive that I'd had a blood clot in that area. That was apparently what caused my big problem. She had called in blood thinner shots for me to start in my stomach the next day, along with taking the medication that I would have to take orally. She also told me, that, Mr. Robinson, you're going to have to take blood thinner for the rest of your life. So I went the next day to pick up my prescription for the blood thinner, and um, the pharmacist informed me that um, Dr. Marez had called in one more um, medication. I needed to take medication for pneumonia. I don't know how long I'd had pneumonia, but here I am taking medication for that. About a week later, I returned to sleeping in my bed. Dr. Marez, my Heavenly Father, and Jesus had saved my life one more time. I am so thankful to be here and that I'm able to be able to speak with you all today. This was a major miracle that saved my life. I've just shared with you the major crisis that I had. Here's what I believe. I believe that what happened with my fist must have jarred loose a blood clot or blood clots in my lung or lungs, um, which allowed me to be able to breathe again. An absolute miracle. My, ne my next miracle is number 10. And this is a, a potential death Route 11 near Abingdon, 
happened in 2019. I was traveling on Interstate 81 going toward um, exit 13 from Abingdon. I turned at exit 13 off the interstate onto the road that connects to the old Route 11. I stop at the traffic light because the light is red. I, my plan is to, is to turn left on old Route 11 and go toward Bristol on the old, old highway. The light changes to green. For some reason, I do not move my car until about three seconds later. And then I'm beginning to cross the edge of the, of the road going in, into the lane going toward Abingdon, going toward that lane. I almost would never look to my right to see if it's clear for me to continue. I almost never would do that. A large tractor trailer was traveling down the road, coming from Abingdon, going toward Bristol on Route 11, a speed, I would guess, at least 60 miles an hour. Coming down, if you all are familiar with that road, there's a, there's a grade that goes down toward the traffic light. Traffic light is at the bottom. That, when that truck went by me in the traffic light, it was just like a flash. Just happened, bang, just that quick. I stopped my car just in time to avoid being hit by that tractor trailer. If that truck had hit me, there wouldn't be anything left of me or my car. That's it. I'm done. Why did I wait those three seconds, and why did I happen to look to my right? Why did this happen? The only explanation is my Heavenly Father and Jesus, they were with me. That's the only way that I avoided having that horrific accident. They saved my life again. Next miracle is uh, number 11. This is a near death at Route 19 in Abingdon. This happened in 2022. I was traveling north on Russell Road going toward a traffic light at the intersection with Route 19. My plan was, was to turn right on Route 19, would be going to a four lane road, I would be traveling toward Hansonville. As I approached the traffic light, the light changed to green. There was two vehicles in front of me. Um, they go through the traffic light, it's green. And both, both of those vehicles, for some reason, as I recall, they were over into the passing lane in the left lane going toward Hansonville. They'd already been through the light and were in the lane. There were two green arrows for me to continue on Route 19. Now, I would almost never look to my left to see if it was clear to me because I've got a green light. This time, I did look to my left, and here was a large pickup truck pulling a large trailer. The guy had to mean the speed limit and that what at that light is is forty five miles per hour. That truck driver had to been doing at least fifty five. He goes through me by that light flash just like this. Um, if I had not looked to my left, he would have broadsided me. I stopped just in time. Again, I would have been broadsided. On the, on, the, on the driver's side of my car, more than likely I would have been killed if I had, hadn't stopped. Why did I look to my left? Why did I do that? The only answer is my Heavenly Father and Jesus, they were with me. That's the only explanation. They were with me and they saved my life again. I have to be one of the most blessed men in America to have experienced all of those miracles. In closing, I want to thank all of you all for being here with me this evening. Again, if any of you all have had miracles in your life, please write them down and then share them with your family and your friends. Don't do like what I did do. Don't wait 20 or 30 years until you share them with them. 
Yule, would you come down and dismiss us with one of your beautiful prayers? <laughs>